What is up, coordinators and naturals? I am just a simple new type, and in this video, we are making our way through the cosmic era as we leave CE-71 and jump to CE-73 as a second alliance plant war begins. We are trying to make our way through most of the cosmic era, so you all will be prepared for Mobile Suit Gundam Seed Freedom when it releases in January of 2024. In Gundam Seed Destiny, we will see a shift as we focus our attention more towards Zaft at the beginning of the series. Earth Alliance will be taking the role of the antagonist for a little bit as we follow a new version of the biological CPU. Let's not waste any time and dive right into this. June 15th, CE-71. We return to the Battle of Orb. A young Shin Asuka and his family is retreating Orb territory as the attack takes place. As they run towards the transport vessel, Shin's sister, Mayu, drops her phone. Shin goes to pick it up for her, right as Kira in the Freedom fires on the island towards Calamity. Shin is blown back by the explosion. He gets up to find Mayu's arm severed meters from her body. His entire family is killed. Cosmic Era 73 It's been a year since the Junius Treaty has been signed. For details on the Junius Treaty, watch our last video on CE-71. There is peace, but the tensions between Plant and Earth Alliance never went away. O4, Plant Colony, Armory 1. Kergali is meeting with the Plant Supreme Council Chairman, Gilbert Derendal. Athernzala is by her side, going by the pseudonym Alex Dino. They didn't meet at the Capitol to keep a low profile. In the city, we run into three biological CPUs wandering through the colony. This is Sting Oakley, Stella Lucier, and Owl Neater. This team is known as the Phantom Pain. Phantom Pain is a special forces unit of the Omni Enforcer and is funded and ordered directly by Lord Gibral. A part of this is a new line of bio CPUs, the Extended. Unlike the Boosted Man that we saw in Gundam Seed, these biological CPUs are more stable and quick-witted. However, they still take drugs and are tortured from birth. However, unlike the Boosted Man, the Extended uses capsules called the Cradle to wipe out their memories every once in a while. Kergali is concerned that Earth and Zaft are making moves towards another war. In the city, Shin runs into Stella, the manic pixie biological CPU of his dreams. But she runs away. Durandal assures Kigali that Zaft has no intentions of attacking Earth and will only defend themselves. A few hangers away from Kigali and Durandal, the Phantom Pain team suddenly comes in and attacks Zaft personnel and hijacks three Zaft mobile suits. These are the Chaos, Gaia, and Abyss Gundam. The ZGMF X24S Chaos Gundam is a mobile suit that can transform into a mobile armor. Its mobile armor pods are very similar to the pods used with the Mobius Zero, but has the Dragoon system integrated into it. This, along with all Gundams of the second stage series of suits, are equipped with a Deuterion Beam Energy Transfer System. Nuclear powered mobile suits are no longer allowed in accordance with the Junius Treaty. However, Zaft found a workaround by creating nuclear powered batteries that can transfer energy wirelessly, making refueling effortless. It is also equipped with variable phase shift armor. The ZGMF X88S Gaia Gundam can transform into an earth terrain mobile armor that resembles the Baku. Because of this design, Gaia mainly works best as a short ranged fighter. In space, it has thruster mounted wings, which greatly improves the AMBAC system. It also uses the Vajra beam saber, just like the Baku. The ZGMF X 31S Abyss Gundam also has a mobile armor form that specializes in underwater battle. This unit is also the most heavily armed of the three units. It can also use a handheld beam lance for close combat, even in the water, as the lance has a physical blade. And for defense, it can use the pair of shoulder mounted binders as shields as they are anti beam coated. During the assault, Kigali recognizes that Zaft is making Gundams. Now director Mitsuo Fukuda likes taking the Gundam acronym and shoving whatever English words he can to make it work. The Project G mobile suits, which include Strike, Duel, Aegis, and others, stood for 
general, unilateral, neuralink dispersive, autonomic, maneuver, synthesis, system. Justice, freedom, and providence were called Generation Unsubdued Nuclear Drive Assault Module Complex. And the second stage Gundams like the Impulse and Gaia like we see in Destiny are referred to as Generation Unrestricted Network Drive Assault Module, while chaos ensues, Athern and Kigali get into the Zaku Warrior. The ZGMF-1000 Zaku Warrior is a part of the new Millennium series. Zaku stands for Zaft Armored Keeper of Unity. The Zaku uses the wizard system, which is similar to silhouettes and striker packs. These are interchangeable packs that can be used in different environments. It has an anti-beam shield, a beam tomahawk, an assault rifle, and a heavy blade, and much more. Other units of the new Millennium series include the Dom Trooper and the Goof Ignited. These are all clearly based on their UC counterparts. Stella starts attacking the Zaku. Meanwhile, on the Minerva, Shin gets into the Core Splendor and launch the modules of his mobile suit. All the modules form to create the Impulse Gundam. The ZGMF X56S Impulse Gundam is also a part of Zaf's second stage series. It is designed to be piloted by an ace. Like the Striker and Wizard packs, the Impulse uses silhouette packs, which help get around some of the rules of the Junius Treaty. Silhouette packs will vary depending on battle situations. Unlike the other three units, the Impulse doesn't have a mobile armor form. It does, however, have the Core Splendor as one of its modules. The YFX M56S Core Splendor acts as the cockpit when connected to the Impulse, but when separated, it can function as a fighter. It was originally tested on a Zaku called the Zaku Splendor. It is armed with two nose-mounted 20mm machine guns and two wing-mounted anti-air missile launchers that are loaded with several Ladybird-guided missiles. Shin comes in with the impulse to help out Atherin and Kigali. He has the sword silhouette pack equipped. Outside of the plant colony Armory 1, an Earth Alliance ship is cloaked using Mirage Colloid technology, which goes against the Junius Treaty. The captain is Neo Roanoke, and is command of the Gertie Lou class ship. You could probably guess who this man is based off the voice actor alone. The Gertie Lou ship is the evolution of the Archangel class ship. It uses Mirage Colloid tech, which is illegal, but allows them to camouflage themselves. It has a Gottfried beam cannon, multi-barrel Vulcans, and a vertical missile launcher. It also has two gas propulsion modules and a rocket anchor. They engage in battle with the colony. A few Dagger L's take out the Zaft escort fleet, which block all other ships from leaving the port. Sting, Stella, and Owl team up to take out the Impulse Gundam. Atherin and the Zaku assists Impulse. Zaft pilot Ray Zabaril is able to get his Zaku Phantom up and running to assist in the battle. Ray gets Lunamaria Hawk's Zaku free as well. The ZGMF-1001 Zaku Phantom is the commander version of the Zaku Warrior. Its only difference is that it has two shields instead of one. It can also use the wizard system. Neo Roanoke goes out in the Exus to buy the three Gundam hijackers some time. The TSMA4F Exus is based on the Mobius and uses the wire guided gun barrels similarly. Unlike the Mobius, the Exus can only be used in space. Meanwhile, the Minerva is still inside the colony. They are wondering if they should follow the ship outside. Neo and Ray pass each other. Ray's seed factor goes off. He seems to be connected to Neo in some way. The Minerva launches the Force Silhouette Flyer for Shin. The Force Silhouette is analogous to the L Striker Pack. It improves the Impulse Gundam's mobility while in Earth atmosphere. Shin goes and equips the Force Silhouette. The Impulse's improved mobility greatly outpaces the Gaia, Chaos, and Abyss. Abyss Gundam shoots a hole in the colony. Minerva prepares to launch. Durandal is on board. Atherin and Kigali exit the Zaku and demand to see the chairman. The LHM BB-01 Minerva is Zaf's first ship since the end of the war. It is the only battleship to have the Deuterian beam transmitter equipped. It also has a launcher specifically designed for Impulse Gundam. It has a positron blaster cannon torpedo launcher, 
and missile launcher. It also is a part of the second stage series. So what is the second stage series? This was created after the new Millennium series and includes Savior, Chaos, Abyss, Impulse, and Gaia Gundams, along with the Minerva and the Core Splendor. Impulse and Phantom make their way out into space. The Exus begins attacking Shin. The Minerva finally makes its way outside the colony. The captain of the Minerva is Talia Gladys. Her tactic of saving the Impulse is to attack the Gertie Lu class ship and thus drive it away from the battlefield. Mia retreats as the Minerva sends out a signal for Shin and Rey to retreat as well. The Minerva attacks the Gertie Lu class ship. Neo orders them to make their retreat, but Minerva continues to chase them. The Gertie Lu class ship detaches its propulsion module. The module crashes directly into the Minerva. The damage is minimal, but the Gertie Lu class ship is able to get some distance from Zaft. While all this was going down, Kigali and Atherin got on board the Minerva before they ended up in the midst of battle. On the Gertie Lu, three biological CPUs are in the cradle. Kigali and Atherin are treated as allies while they are on board Minerva. Chairman Durandal shows the two the new Zaku and the Minerva launch system for the Impulse. While talking to Durandal, Shin yells at Kigali for being idealistic. The Gertie Lu is spotted on radar. Luna Maria Hawk in the Zaku Warrior and Shin in the Impulse launch. They enter into a debris field and search for the Gertie Lu. Abyss, Gaia, and Chaos lead them into a trap and begin attacking. The Gertie Lu class sends out daggers. Because of the debris, the Minerva's heavy weapons were of no use. On the bridge, Atherin thinks he is the captain and gives orders. Really weird. Atherin's big plan is to simply fire long-range weapons in a short-range environment to break up some of the debris, where they would instantly attack the Gertie Lu class. That doesn't seem like the most complicated idea. Ray chases Neo in the Exus. He is most certainly playing with Ray. The Gertie Lu class sends out a signal flare to retreat. It seems that Minerva's plan worked, but they ran out of ammo to follow up on the attack of the Gertie Lu. As things calm down, Captain Talia and Durandal praise Atherin for his military prowess. It seems Durandal is allowing Atherin so much agency because he's trying to lure Atherin back into Zaft. And sadly, Atherin actually buys into it. Uh, the length the show goes to to essentially put certain pieces together. Back at Junius 7, a group of Patrick Zala loyalists are plotting something as independent terrorists. They set off thrusters throughout Junius 7's remains. This caused the debris to start making its way towards Earth. Minerva, the Gertie Lu class ship, and the people of Earth are all informed of the situation and make their way towards the debris. On Earth, a group called Logos is meeting with Lord Jibril. Logos is a secret society made up of contractors and industrialists who make up the military industrial complex for the Earth Alliance. It seems that Logos holds most of the power as Blue Cosmos and Phantom Pain actually seem to be subdivision of this secret organization. Durandal also mentions in the first episode that Blue Cosmos is a belief and not an organization. And to that I say, what? Then explain this man and now this man, who clearly are playing leadership roles. Anyways, it is clear that Lord Jibril is the leader of Logos and thus the new leader of Blue Cosmos. That's right, leader. They start making their plans and strategies on how to start a new war if Junius 7 debris hits Earth. By the looks of it, no one knows of the rogue terrorists, so this seems like a natural occurrence for Junius 7 and thus should be treated as a bipartisan issue. However, Lord Jibral finds a way to make it all about the naturals. Diarca and Izak are making their way towards Junius 7 as they have been assigned to break up the debris. Izak is in command while Diarca is now a regular recruit as he has been demoted. In Zaft, Green is a regular recruit. Black and White is squad leader. Red is an elite recruit and White is captain or commander. They begin breaking apart the debris using meteor breakers when suddenly a group of Jin high maneuver type 2s begin attacking Zaft. 
the ZG MF 1017 M2 Gen High Maneuver Type 2 is fitted with large versions of normal backpack thrusters for high mobility during close combat. Its close combat capabilities are improved and can keep its own with the new Zaku. Izik doesn't know who the squad is or why they are attacking their own kind. Atherin asks Talia if he could use a mobile suit to help out. She refuses, but Durandal allows it. Yeah, butter up that Atherin. Butter him up good. Atherin is allowed to use a Zaku. The Minerva team and Atherin begin to launch. Gaia, Abyss, and Chaos make their way towards Izik's team. Izik and Diarka recognize the stolen Gundams. The Minerva team also makes their way to Junia 7 and engage in battle. Anarchy breaks out as it seems like a civil war amongst Zaft is currently happening. Gertie Lou is most likely hidden and the stolen Gundams are technically Zaft property. To Earth, this must seem like it was all Zaft's doing. Orb and Alliance governments inform their people of what is happening above them currently. The Meteor Breakers are successful and break the giant piece of debris into two chunks, but they need to break it up into smaller pieces. Atherin meets up with Izik and Diarka. Atherin, Diarka, and Izik does damage on the battlefield. Shin is taken aback as he is observing three veterans in action. The Minerva calls for a retreat. Talia realizes soon the Minerva will be swept up with Junia 7 into Earth's atmosphere. Talia tells Durandal to retreat on the Voltaire. Kigali stays behind on the Minerva and waits for Atherin. Minerva plans on following Junia 7 and destroying any remaining debris while entering Earth's atmosphere. Shin and Atherin go out and try to use a meteor breaker, but the rogue terrorists attack them. Atherin is stunned to find that these men are all loyal to his father. The debris and Minerva begin Earth re-entry. Shin saves Atherin and pulls him out of the gravitational pull of Earth, but it is too strong. On Earth, Kida is looking up towards the sky to see a fallen Junia 7. Minerva needs to shoot down the large chunk of Junia 7 entering the atmosphere, but they are concerned that they might hit Atherin and Shin. They fire their Ten Hauser cannon anyways. It breaks apart, but many tiny pieces still hit Earth. The attack is devastating to many cities around the world. Atherin is falling towards Earth, but Shin comes in to save him. They are able to land, but instead of heading towards Carpinteria, they decide to head towards Orb. Chairman Durandal decides to give support to Earth, but the people are already blaming Plant for trying to destroy the world. On board Minerva, Luna Maria tells Atherin that they all look up to him as they studied the former war. Now Luna Maria is buttering up Atherin. Meanwhile, Kira just looks into the ocean the entire episode. Minerva finally makes its way towards Orb. She is met with Unisirin, son of the current Prime Minister of Orb, and is to be wed with Kigali. This marriage was apparently arranged way before CE-71. Kigali is informed that they intend to create an alliance with the Atlantic Federation. Orb was slightly hit during the Break the World incident and thus needs some aid. The Atlantic Federation would be able to provide aid during this time of need. Kigali naturally doesn't approve of this. At the hangar, Ramius meets with Talia and helps fix up Minerva. Atherin drives out to visit Lacus and Kira. He tells Kira that he doesn't really know what he is currently fighting for. The next morning, Atherin tells the same thing to Kigali and tells him that he will be returning to Zaft. Before he leaves, Atherin gives Kigali a promise ring. While Shin is crying about his family, he happens to run into Kira who is looking at a cenotaph. He makes a comment about how all the flowers should burn. He sucks. It is official. The Orb Union, Eurasian Federation, and Atlantic Federation is forcing Zaft to meet their demands. Chairman Durandal wants to continue negotiations with Earth, but the people of Plant are starting to see this as a sign of weakness. The EA prepares for an attack on the plants. They prepare their new Wyndhams with nukes. The GAT-04 Wyndham is the successor to the Dagger L, which were all based off of the original Strike Gundam. The Wyndham is said to be the fully realized version of the Strike Gundam and can actually somewhat hold itself against freedom. Like its predecessors, the Wyndham is compatible with the Striker Packs. However, its shoulders make it impossible to mount the Sword and Launcher Striker Pack. At Zaft, Diarka launches in a Zaku Warrior and Izak launches in the Slash 
Zaku Phantom. The ZGMF 1001K slash Zaku Phantom is a version of the Zaku Phantom that is equipped with the EXK slash Wizard Pack. It is designed to be a close combat mobile suit. It is also equipped with a Hydra Gatlin Beam Cannon and a G7 Max, which is the strongest melee weapon from Zaft. The battle between the two forces begin. Zaft quickly finds out that they are equipped with nukes. The Wyndham's fire nukes. Izak's team tries to get them in time, but they were tricked. Luckily, Zaft has the Neutron Stampeder on standby. The Neutron Stampeder is a device that remotely controls the movement of free neutrons to induce runaway nuclear fission reactions. When activated, it causes the immediate detonation of any nuclear weapons within its area of effect. But it can only be used once because of the quantum fresnels that make up its firing mechanism disintegrate during use, and it's effective only against enemies who are using nuclear technology. It fires, taking out the first wave of nukes and the Windoms. Earth forces retreat to their lunar base. Back at Zaft, while waiting for Durandal, Atherin meets a Lacus lookalike, which leaves them very confused. This fake Lacus even has her own Haro. While meeting with Atherin, Durandal is appalled that after declaring war, Earth would respond with nukes less than 12 hours later. To him, this doesn't even feel like a war. Atherin tells Durandal his real name. Of course, Durandal most likely knew of this information. He continues slathering butter all over Atherin. As the people of Plant descend into anger, the fake Lacus Klein attempts to bring the coordinators together. Durndal tells Atherin that he truly believes this woman can bring all the coordinators together more so than him as chairman. And with all that butter, Durndal finally throws it all in the pan as he finally asks Atherin to return to Zaft. He does so by showing Atherin the savior. The ZGMF X23S Savior Gundam is a secret second stage series weapon similar to the Impulse. It is a high maneuverable unit that can transform into a fast mobile armor. It is similar to the design of the Freedom and Justice, but also has many sensors that was once seen on the Aegis. It also has the Deuterian Beam Energy Transfer System and Variable Shift Armor. Ultimately, Savior was designed for a hit-and-run situation where a pilot needs to get in and get out very fast. Meanwhile, the fake Lacus forces Zathrin to eat dinner with her. She wants to know if her performance is as good as the real Lacus. She seems to be a big Lacus fangirl. She also seems to recognize that she is somewhat being used, but is okay with it, sort of. It all seems sad. But all this culminates into Atherin finally deciding to return to Zaft. Lord Gibral is mad about the failed attack on Zaft. However, currently the EA is on their way to take control of Zaft-controlled Earth territory, such as Carpenteria. At Orb, Kigali is losing the battle of convincing her fellow councilmen that joining the Atlantic Federation isn't a great idea. However, the people seem to be tired of Uzumi's stubbornness and now Kigali's stubbornness. Meanwhile, war is declared and the Minerva is still on orb, which is on the verge of being on the opposite side of the war. Plant still doesn't completely trust Atherin yet, so they get Isaac and Diarka to escort him while in the colonies. The three go to visit Nikol and Rusty's grave. Isaac suggests that Atherin stays and joins Zaft. Isaac tells him not to let his potential go to waste. On orb, Andrew Watfield sends a secret message to Minerva that Orb is about to join the EA and that they need to get out of here. Even though he is a neutral, Watfield was originally Zaft and a part of the Klein faction, which is still Zaft. He tells Talia that the message comes from the Desert Tiger. The Orb Union finalizes the treaty with the Earth Alliance. Minerva preps for the departure. Gagali personally sees off Minerva. Yuna suggests they get married faster so the people of Orb have something to unite over. Operation Spear of Twilight is in full effect by Zaft. As Earth plans an assault on Gibraltar and Carpinteria, Zaft plans to aid its Earth bases. Minerva leaves Orb territory only to suddenly be met with Earth forces waiting on the outskirts of what was once the neutral zone. Minerva is no longer welcome on Earth, it seems. The Minerva mobile suit team prepares to launch. Impulse launches with the Force silhouette. Shin will go out and support while Luna Maria and Rey guard on top of Minerva. Kira is also still having a staring contest with the ocean. I think he is losing. The EA flagship preps a new mobile armor for launch called the Zamzaza. 
The YMAF-X6BD Zamzaza is the evolution of the MA2 Mobius, even though they look nothing alike. It is controlled by a crew of three members. It has Vulcans, multi-phase energy cannons, low pressure guns, reflector shields, and oscillation crushers. Minerva activates its turn hauser and fires on the mobile armor. However, the mobile armor is able to deflect the power of the positron blaster cannon. Impulse Gundam and Zamzaza engage in battle. Even though Orb isn't officially a part of the EA yet, they send out forces to help EA against Minerva. Minerva is heading back towards Orb territory. Orb fires a few warning shots at the Zaft ship. The Zamzaza grabs a hold of the Impulse right as it loses power and powers off its variable shift armor. Impulse heads towards the ship. It fires the Deuterian Beam Energy Transfer System at Impulse Gundam and it instantly powers back up. Impulse takes out its Beam Saber and destroys the Zamzaza. The sword silhouette launches. Shin equips it to the Gundam and then proceeds to do damage to all the battleships like a madman. Orb watches in awe. Back at Zaft, Athrin dons the Zaft uniform once again. Durndal reinstates him into Zaft as Faith Elite Forces. Faith stands for Fast Acting Integrate Tactical Headquarters. Faith members work outside of Zaft's chain of command and report directly to the Plant Supreme Council and the Chairman. Athrin launches in the Savior. The Minerva crew praises Shin for getting them out of a deadly situation. At Orb, Yuna decides to marry Kigali on the day of the signing of the treaty with the Earth Alliance. Watfield tells Ramius that it doesn't look like coordinators like him, Kira, and Lacus will be welcome on Earth anymore, and will probably have to move to the plants. Ramius just wants a place to die in peace. Later that night, a crew of mysterious mercenaries come to attack. Luckily, Pink Chan saves the day by waking everyone up. The Mercs attack. Watfield has a robot arm now, which is neat. They get to a safe room and realize that this is a special ops squad of coordinators, and they were targeting Lacus specifically. Their team has failed to kill Lacus on foot, but it must be done. They all launch their ashes. The UMF SSO-3 Ash is a new amphibious mobile suit. Unlike the goons, which don't operate well outside of water, the Ash functions really well on land. It has a missile launcher, high energy beam cannon, Photo Maser Cannon, Machine Gun, and Beam Claw. They attack the house and start to make it towards the outer wall of the shelter. Kira decides that it is time to pilot the Freedom once again. He incapacitates most of the Ashes, but they all self-destruct to conceal their identity. Tori comes out of nowhere. Watfield is starting to question if moving back to plant is a good idea. Kigali delivers a letter to Kira about her sudden wedding. Kira and the team decide that they need to go save Kigali. The Archangel crew once again preps for launch. Ramius tells Watfield that he should be captain, but he gives the role to Ramius, who mans the captain's chair on the Archangel once again. Freedom launches from the Archangel. The Orb military is informed of their movement. Suddenly, Freedom comes in and takes Kigali away. A few Murasamis come in and chase Kira. The MVF M11C Murasame is the predecessor to the Astray. It can function in both space and earth, and its mobile armor mode is extremely fast. It can hold its own to mobile suits like Chaos Gundam. It has Vulcans, a beam saber, a beam cannon, the Ikazuchi beam rifle, air-to-air -air missiles, air-to-surface missiles, and a shield. There is a Murasami also on board the Archangel, which we will see Watfield pilot. The Freedom takes out both units with relative ease. It returns to the Archangel, but it is surrounded by orb forces. The Archangel heads underwater and avoids their forces. Orb should know about these upgrades, right? Kogali is angry that they made themselves criminals of Orb by capturing her. Kira gives Kogali her ring back that Atherin gave her. The Minerva crew is on shore leave in Carpinteria when Atherin makes his way on board in his new savior Gundam. Everyone realizes that he is now a member of Faith and salutes him. Luna Maria informs Atherin of the situation happening at Orb. He is shocked to hear that Kogali is aligning herself with the Earth Alliance and that she is getting married. But Luna Maria buried the lead and eventually tells Atherin that she escaped with Kira. Atherin gives Talia a faith badge. Both Atherin and Talia have been assigned as a faith member while being assigned to the same ship. Now remember, faith members have authority outside of the normal chain of command, but having two faith members at the same time on the same ship makes leadership slippery slope. Essentially, both Talia and Atherin now have the same rank. 
This means that both can attempt to outrank each other. It's a weird situation that could have made for a solid core theme for Zaft, but it is merely a tool to create minor drama here and there. It's unfortunate. Durandal also gives orders to Minerva to head towards Gibraltar. Once there, they are assigned to assist in a battle to capture Suez. Located in the Suez Canal, the Suez base is the largest base in the North African region. It serves as an important supply distribution route for the Earth Alliance across the Mediterranean Sea and Africa. Meanwhile, the show really wants us to see Luna Maria's ass for some reason. I thought the boob jiggling in the first season was pretty bad, but here we are. Anyways, it seems that Luna Maria has taken a liking to Atherin. At EA, the Phantom Pain team makes their way towards Gibraltar as well. Minerva makes its leave from Carpinteria, but Neo and his crew are waiting for them on the outskirts of their base. Shin is interrupted reading a magazine about high and mighty color. At the EA Indian Ocean Frontline Ocean Base, that's a mouthful, all forces head out to Suez including the Phantom Pain. All except Stella because their Gaia Gundam can't swim or fly. Gaia is to remain and defend the base. Neo also heads out in the Wyndham. Talia sends out the Minerva mobile suits, with Atherin taking command. They attack Phantom Pain along with 30 Wyndhams. Shin is going out too far and getting attacked. Luna Maria and Rey begin to launch as they chase Abyss underwater. A Zaft Vazgulav sub is assisting Minerva as well. They launch Goons, which if you remember from Seed, is Zaft's underwater line of mobile suits before the Ash. Abyss destroys one of the goons. Shin goes in too deep attacking Neo. Meanwhile, Gaia gets impatient and chases Shin in the shallow part of the water. She is able to get an attack on Impulse Gundam. Shin engages in battle even though Atherin tells him to pull back. Gaia attacks the Gundam, leaving the base unguarded. Shin sees refugees trying to flee. After Zaft finds the base, Neo tells the Phantom Pain team to retreat. But Owl in the Abyss wants to prove himself. He destroys the allied Zaft Vazgalov sub. Shin goes mad and begins destroying the base. He lets the refugees free. Back at Zaft, Atherin slaps Shin for disobeying orders. <laughs> this is a loss for Minerva. The Archangel are picking up on Zaft broadcasts to find that the fake Lacus is the focus of their media. Since this is all over Zaft media, it is certainly that Darendal knows of the situation and might be involved himself. Minerva is on its way towards Mahamal base. They meet with the commander of the base. They realize that EA needs to attack Suez in order to break through and attack Gibraltar. But it seems there is some resistance with the Eurasian forces. Zaft must use this opportunity to seize the gate in the Suez ravine, where there happens to be a power source. However, it is protected by a positron cannon. There also happens to be a mobile armor with a positron deflector shield. Minerva must clear a path for the rest of Zaft forces to make their way towards Gibraltar. Shin and Atherin run into one another. Atherin reminds Shin how much of a bitch he is. <laughs> the Minerva team meet in the briefing room. They are to take out the positron cannon that is protecting the power supply. They are working with Connell and some resistant forces during this mission. Atherin assigns Shin to handle the mobile armor protecting the power source. They prep for launch. Shin and the Impulse will fly through the pitch black ravine as the Core Splendor is the only thing small enough to make it through. Atherin, Ray, and Shin launch. They have Lesep's class ships assisting them. The Minerva fires the Tenhauser, but the mobile armor deflects the attack. The YMAG X7F Gelsgi is the second largest mobile armor used in this war. Just like the Zamzaza, this mobile suit is piloted with a crew of three. Its special weapon is the Positron Reflector Shield. Unlike its predecessors, the Zamzaza, the Gelsgi, shield emitters are all forward-facing, effectively reducing the time to deploy the shield without needing to reposition the mobile armor's whole body. Shin sneaks in from the back to get the upper hand on the EA. The long rain is descending underground, but Shin uses a dagger L and throws it into the hole, destroying the cannon and its power source. As Zaf destroys the cannon, the refugees instantly turn on the Alliance. And I mean really turn on the Alliance. <laughs> Atherin congratulates Shin on succeeding. Atherin is somewhat worried that Shin is enjoying the victory a little too much. Mir Campbell, the fake Lacus, is doing a performance for the Zaf troops. She is performing on top of a pink Zaku warrior, and you're damn right that Bandai makes a gunpla of this mobile suit. Atherin is surprised to see her at the base. 
Everyone seems to notice that Lacus' performance is a little off. No one knows that this isn't the real Lacus. The Phantom Pain team is wandering around the Black Sea base spying again. It seems Ray and Durandal meet for the first time in ages as they have a strong relationship. Also, look at this. Shin sucks so much that he can't even shake hands properly. Man, Shin sucks. They all have a meal while Durandal discusses his true intentions for getting involved in this war. He discusses how to stop war and the cycle of hate, but then he mentions what if their true intentions isn't war, but to keep profits coming in. This is where Durandal explains that this war is fighting the military industrial complex that keeps war going. For the Earth Alliance, that means Logos and Blue Cosmos. The next morning, the Minerva team meet with Hein Westenfluss. Hein is a member of Faith and an ace pilot in his own right. During the first Alliance plant war, he was assigned to the Hawkins team and was at the Battle of Yaqin Dwe. Hein tells the team that he is assigned to the Minerva and he doesn't really understand why as Atherin and the team seem competent without him. This seems to be Durandal's doing. The team is on shore leave. Shin goes out and stares at waves when he runs into Stella dancing. She accidentally falls off of the bluffs. Shin jumps in to save her. I appreciate that Shin forces her to go buoyant instead of swimming and saving the day. Marie's love to show people saving people from the water. Do not do this in real life, people. They are eventually able to get up on shore, where they do the whole we are wet so we are taking off our clothes as a metaphor for vulnerability cliche. Atherin comes to save Shin and Stella. The Phantom Pain team yells out for Stella. Both Shin and Atherin head back up the cliff to meet up with her compatriots. They drop her off, but Atherin remembers them being at L4 Plant Armory 1 during the attack. They go their separate ways. Atherin seems to ignore this for now. I'm glad everyone had the day off, but what's happening back out in space? Yeah, that seems about right. Jibril and the president of the Atlantic Federation is having a conversation. It is clear that the president is being controlled by Jibril and Logos. Their initial battle strategy for war seems to be failing, but because Orb has an impressive military presence, they want the Orb Union to fight at the Black Sea. On board the Gertie Lou, the team is trying to get Stella to go to sleep in the cradle, but she doesn't want to give up the handkerchief that Shin gave her. Remember that the cradle wipes out the biological CPU's memories so they are more stable. Remember, EFF doesn't see these biological CPUs as human. It seems she doesn't want to forget about Shin. Neo wonders if he would be better without any memories. He and the group of scientists ponder on how perhaps the biological CPUs are living a more purposeful and efficient life than those with memories. Wow, this actually is a great moment about if one's experience in life is a burden or a blessing. I think if the show lets this idea breathe a little bit, it could really be... Oh, we're not... we're, we're done? We're done? We're moving on? Hein gets situated on board Minerva, while Orb heads towards their Black Sea base with the Takamikazuchi. Back at Neo's ship, he is informed of the current Orb Union team heading towards the Black Sea, and they must assist Orb. Stella wakes up and has no memories of where the handkerchief came from. She leaves it behind. The Minerva Team Faith members are being briefed on the current situation. Talia also tells Atherin that the Orb military will be present during the battle. Atherin makes one of those anime gaspy noises. You know what I'm talking about. <laughs> yeah, that's it. While prepping for launch, Atherin calls Shin a bitch again, but this time he understands where he is coming from and empathizes with him. The Minerva rushes towards Orb Fleet. They lock onto the flagship vessel with their Tannhauser cannon. Right before the cannon goes off, a beam saber takes out the Tannhauser. From above, our lord and savior. No, not that savior. Yeah, that savior. Our lord and savior has returned. Jesus Yamato. The fire control system was offline when the Tenhauser was destroyed on Minerva. They work to get things operational again and land in the water in the time being. The Archangel makes its way on the battlefield. Kagali launches from the Archangel in their Strike Rouge Otori. The Strike Rouge Otori is the mobile suit that we've seen in the original Seed series, but with the Otori Striker Pack. Otori Striker's flight system is a vast improvement as it is capable of powered flight in the atmosphere compared to the L Striker Pack. The pack is equipped with a beam saber, railgun, large anti-ship sword, missile launcher, and several ring-mounted missiles. This is a new unit for me as this is my first run through with the HD Remastered Edition. I believe in its original run, it was simply an L Striker pack attached to the Rouge. 
she sends a message to Orb Fleet begging to withdraw from battle. Yuna denies knowing Kigali, which leads his own fleet to question his very little authority he has. The Orb Fleet fires on the Archangel. Luckily, Kira does his thing and eliminates all surface-to-air missiles. The Phantom Pain team launches along with Hein on the Minerva. He launches in his Goof Ignited. The ZGMF-2000 Goof Ignited stands for Guardian of Unity Forerunner. The Goof lost the bid at Zaf to the Zaku for the mass-produced mobile suit of choice. However, the performance was so good that when Zaf shifted its focus to Earth-based warfare, they decided to produce the Goof. It does not utilize the wizard system like the Zaku, and it uses a standard flight pack. It is equipped with a Slayer Whip Heat Rod, a Shield Beam Gun, Beam Sword, and a 500mm recoilless rifle. While Orb engage in battle with the Archangel, the Minerva team go after the Phantom Pain team. Kira does damage control. Kigali retreats as Watfield joins the battle in his Murasame. Kira focuses his attention onto Zaft. He takes out Shen's arm. Hein and Stella are fighting when Kira intervenes and takes out Hein's arm. Hein goes in to attack Kira, but Stella goes in to attack both Hein and Kira. She uses her beam saber to take out Hein. That was too quick for either the viewer like me or Atherin to care about his death, but Atherin will use this as fuel to be mad at Kira. The Archangel and Minerva retreat for now. Back on Minerva, Atherin wants to go on his own mission to figure out why the Archangel and Freedom handled this situation the way they did. As a faith member, Talia can't forbid him to go, but gives her blessing anyways. Atherin happens to run into Midiaria or Midi Ha, a former Archangel crew member. Atherin asks her to try to connect them with the Archangel crew somehow so Atherin can talk to them. One day, I might make a video about how the Archangel has a Japanese onsen on board, but for now, I'm going to ignore it. They did a barrel roll in the first season. How does the water stay- Nope, nope, I'm ignoring it. The Archangel receives a cryptic message from Midi in regards to meeting with Atherin. Of course, Kira and Kagali decide to go by themselves. Meanwhile, it seems that Luna Maria is spying on Atherin. Shin and Rei are assigned a mission by Talia to go out and investigate a possible nearby outpost that they received intel on. Kagali, Midi, Kira, and Atherin meet at a random location. Kira tells Atherin that Lacus was almost assassinated by coordinators. Atherin still wants to fight with Zaft regardless of the possibility that Durandal might be up to something. Shin and Rei make it to an unknown outpost and search the building on foot. They stumble onto a lab. When Ray sees it, he has a panic attack. Atherin still wants to fight with Zaft regardless of the possibility that Durandal might be up to something. This is horrible. Atherin, you are being dumb right now. Back at the outpost, the entire Minerva team goes to investigate and is horrified by what they find. This seems to be the lab where they created biological CPUs. Horrendous experimentations, along with a survival of the fittest mindset, leads to a very focused and efficient soldier, but at a cost. Al is having a little freak out when he finds out that Zaft is at the base where they were tested on. He keeps crying out to Mother and wonders if Mother is dead. This triggers Stella's trigger word. These are conditional words that helps keep the biological CPU in check, but when used too much can cause abnormal effects. Stella's word is death, Al's is Mother, and Sting is Dream. Triggering the word death somehow helps Stella retain the memories of Shin. She goes out in Gaia Gundam while everyone is distracted by Owl's panic attack. Minerva picks up on Gaia. Shin and Atherin go out and attack. Shin uses his beam saber to make a convenient slash right through the cockpit. It is there that Shin realizes that the pilot and thief of Gaia Gundam is Stella. Shin is shocked to find out that the pilot of Gaia Gundam is Stella. Panicked, he brings her on board the Impulse Gundam and the Minerva. He brings her directly to the med bay and says the word death, activating her trigger word. She starts choking out the medic, but they are able to apprehend her. Talia reprimands Shin for his actions. They head back down to the med bay, where the doctors have figured out that she is one of the extended and a biological CPU. She wakes up and goes mad. Shin tries to get her to recognize him, but she doesn't have any memories. There is a weird insinuation that Stella is lost, and Neo sees Stella as more than that. I have no idea what is implied here. I assume a mentor role, but then you have moments like this. 
So who knows? Anyways, Stella wakes up and eventually remembers Shin. Watfield sees that tomorrow will be the last day to see Mir Campbell, the fake Lacus, live on Earth before the end of her tour. Watfield and Lacus use this as an opportunity to sneak back onto the plants. They go out pretending to be the fake Lacus and steal her shuttle. But Mir shows up and claims the other Lacus is the fake. The shuttle takes off, but Zaft Bay sends out mobile suits to take out the shuttle. Luckily, Kira in the Freedom comes in and incapacitates the units. Lacus promises to return to Kira as she goes into space. Zaft goes to investigate the shuttle, but they are gone. They were picked up by the former Klein faction and her ship, the Eternal. On the Minerva, Luna Maria is given a debriefing on her mission to spy on Atherin. She is haunted by the fact that she heard them mentioning that Lacus is fake and coordinators tried to kill the real Lacus. When they were on shore leave, she saw the fake Lacus with Atherin. Atherin said it wasn't what it seems. Luna Maria is starting to understand what Atherin actually meant. Meanwhile, Kira brings Miri to the Archangel. She is joining the team again. Orb forces are trying to head off the Minerva around Crete. Their forces begin to converge. Everyone preps for launch. Impulse and Savior head out on Minerva. Impulse launches with the Blast Silhouette Pack. This pack is designed for long range bombardment. It also has a beam javelin for close range combat. It has thrusters to allow it to hover in Earth atmosphere. Kigali does sad face while the Archangel decides to intervene in the Battle of Creek. On the Archangel, Freedom and Strike Rouge launch. Al and Shin fight one another. Atherin is sad that he is killing orb pilots, but he is still killing them. Twelve Murasamis approach Minerva. Ray and Luna Maria are guarding the ship with their mobile suits. The ship is still taking damage. Atherin comes in to help, but Chaos and Abyss distract them. One Murasami comes in to destroy the bridge of the Minerva, but Kira comes in to save the day. Kira takes out Chaos Gundam's thrusters. Meanwhile, Shin throws his javelin and destroys Abyss, killing. Ow. Minerva decides to treat the Archangel as an enemy. Kigali is still trying to get troops to stop fighting, but it is fruitless. Luna Maria's Zaku goes down, but she is still alive. One Murasami pilot kamikazes on the Minerva and takes out most of its weapons. Shin equips the sword silhouette, while Kira and Atherin yell each other's name. Kira! Kira! Atherin! Kira uses his beam saber to incapacitate Savior Gundam. Meanwhile, in the Takemi Kazuchi, Tadaka tells everyone to abandon ship, including Yuna. He tells the crew to go to the Archangel. He plans on taking out Minerva himself. Now why does this matter? So Tadaka is an Atha loyalist. You've seen him throughout the series saying things like, why are we fighting? People seem to do that a lot in this series. But most importantly, when Shin's family died at the Battle of Orb, Tadaka was there for him when Shin had no one. So anyway, Shin comes in and murders him. I think the writers of this show wanted this to be more of an emotional payoff than it actually was. Back at the Archangel, there are a lot more men now due to the people who fled the Takamikazuchi. Dude, why are you guys all on the bridge? Go to like a meeting room or something. After the battle, Shin goes to visit Stella. Her condition is getting worse and they don't know what to give her to keep her alive. After that battle, Shin seems to have lost faith in Atherin. He calls him weak and says that perhaps he was strong in the past. Shin overhears Talia talking about giving Stella to Zaf scientist before her inevitable death. Shin and Atherin run into one another. This time, Shin calls Atherin a bitch and tells him to get his shit together this time. Later that night, Shin decides to get Stella some help. He knocks out the medic by punching her in the stomach, which isn't possible. You can't make someone go to sleep by hitting them in the stomach. This seems to be an anime trope of sorts. He rolls her out, but security in the hangar stops him. Ray comes in to help Shin. He seems to empathize with these bio CPUs. Is this dude a clone? I think this dude might be a clone. Shin goes out and sends an encoded message for Neo to meet. She gives back Stella and has Neo promise him that she must never pilot a mobile suit again. Neo promises him. When he returns to Minerva, he is arrested. Ray was also arrested for helping. Both are thrown into the brig. Back at EA, Stella and Stinger get in their cradle while Neo preps a new mobile suit and plans on having Stella pilot it. He broke that promise to Shen real quick. Stella launches in the X-1 Destroy. The GFAS X-1 Destroy Gundam is a huge mobile suit. The average mobile suit is about 20-ish meters, while the Destroy is a whopping 56 meters. The purpose of this mobile suit? Well, to destroy. Destruction. Mass destruction. 
The suit has a backpack that extends over their face similar to the Forbidden Gundam when in mobile armor mode. When in this mode, it looks very similar to Big Zam from the original series, similar in size as well. The Gundam acronym for this unit stands for Gigantic Unilateral Numerous Dominating Ammunition Fortress. So dumb. Stop trying to fit everything into Gundam. This thing has so many beam cannons, Vulcans, as well as a positron reflector shield which we saw on the Gelsgi. It heads towards the Eurasian area, specifically Berlin, and starts obliterating cities. Meanwhile, Shin was given no punishment for his actions, certainly by the hands of Durandal. The Archangel gets data on this mobile suit. Kira decides to head out to battle. Freedom engages with the giant destroy Gundam. Kagali and some Murasame pilots launch. They take care of Chaos Gundam while Kira focuses on destroy. Minerva is sent to the battlefield. Luna Maria and Atherin's mobile suits are still extremely damaged. Only Shin goes out. Shin starts attacking destroy, but Neo and his Wyndham comes in and tells Shin that Stella is piloting the destroy. Kira takes out Neo's flight system. He crashes, but he survives. The Murasame team takes out Chaos Gundam. All of Stella's teammates are down. Neo told her that if anything goes wrong, to kill everything. She goes berserk. Shin is able to calm her down for a moment, but once she sees freedom, she begins to panic and charges her mini beam cannons. Kira says f*** this and handles business. He uses his beam saber to take down destroy Gundam, killing Stella. The Archangel crew find Neo passed out without his mask on. It just so happens to be Mu La Flaga. Gasp! I didn't see that one coming. Shin gives Stella a somewhat proper burial. He is upset with himself that he couldn't protect her. Shin engages with a simulation of the freedom based off the data that it collected. Atherin seems to be confused about what side of the war he signed up for. Shin and Rei try to remind him. Shin is on a mission to get revenge on freedom for the death of Stella. Meanwhile, back on the Archangel, they find out that the man known as Neo has the exact same DNA as Mu Laflaga. Remius is struggling to be around the prisoner. Chairman Durandal broadcasts a message to the world. He shows the world of the devastating actions that the Alliance caused in Eurasia and how the people of Eurasia now see the Alliance as a monster. They also show footage of the Battle of Berlin the footage has been edited to erase Freedom and the Archangel from existence on the battlefield. Durandal allows Mir Campbell, the fake Lacus, to give a speech to boost the morale of the people. Durandal ends his speech by doxing all of the members of Logos. He says that Zaf's true intentions are to prevent Logos from perpetuating war over and over again. The Archangel is unsure still of what Durandal's true intentions are. They decide that they need to return to Orb. But Zaft is on their trail. They plan for Operation Angel Down to finally take care of Archangel. Kira launches and protects the Archangel while they are being attacked by a Compton-class ship. The Compton-class ship is the upgraded version of the Lesseps-class ship. Unlike the Lesseps, the Compton uses Caterpillar trails. It has a treble cannon, a twin cannon, a rotary gun, and a missile launcher. Most of these ships were deployed on the Eurasian front and were destroyed by the destroyed Gundam in the Battle of Berlin. This ship is what remains of the Compton class. The Minerva makes its way towards the battle. Atherin is against fighting the Archangel. However, even his position as a faith member can't prevent Operation Angel Down from happening. The Minerva makes their way towards the Archangel. Shin launches the Impulse Gundam. As they round the corner, the Archangel and Minerva meet face to face. The Archangel maneuvers out of the way. See, this is what I'm talking about. Does all the water from the Japanese onsen just splash all over the place? Makes no sense. Talia sends a message to the Archangel that they will cease fire if they surrender. However, Ramius declines their offer. During their decline, Talia realizes that the captain is the person who helped fix their ship when at Orb. Freedom is being distracted by Shen and can't help out the Archangel. Kira doesn't aim at cockpits. 
Shin uses this to his opportunity. Minerva sends out another four silhouette while using the current silhouette to attack Freedom. Shin is getting the upper hand. Minerva sends out the sword silhouette. Shin uses his sword and impales Freedom. It goes down in flames. Meanwhile, Minerva uses its Tenhauser and takes down the Archangel. Atherin watches this all go down. The Archangel detaches from a part of its own hole and detonates it, making it seem like they blew up. Meanwhile, Kigali in the Strike Rouge goes out and picks up the remains of Kida's cockpit. Everyone congratulates Shin on his victory. Shin and Atherin get in a fight. Ray stands up for Shin and calls Atherin a bitch this time. Everyone visits Kida in the med bay. They wonder what they will do with Neo Laflaga. Minerva makes its way back to Gibraltar. Shin and Atherin meet with Durandal. He shows the two pilots the top of the line mobile suits, the Destiny and Legend. The ZGMF X 42S Destiny Gundam is a mobile suit designed with technologies banned from the Junius Treaty. This Gundam is based off of Impulse Gundam's battle data. To be more maneuverable, its frame is broken up into tinier pieces similar to that of the Strike Freedom. More on that later. Destiny uses the Vulture Lumiere propulsion system which is originally used by the Stargazer system. If you made it this far in the video, you get the knowledge of knowing that our Stargazer video will probably be out on Wednesday. The one on Destiny's wings is a combat variant that uses internal laser instead of solar winds or external power beam and convert its energy into a strong light pressure which then uses thrust. The system generates a light effect known as wings of light when activated for high speed movements. It also enables the creation of after images when used alongside the Mirage Colloid system. Lots of legal tech being used here. The ZGMF X666S Legend Gundam is the evolution of the Providence Gundam and inherits its Dragoon system. Durandal is gifting these two units to Atherin and Shin, but Atherin's heart seems to be no longer in it. This is technically the third stage mobile suit development plan, where Abyss, Chaos, Impulse, and Savior were a part of the second stage. Both Legend and Destiny have the Hyper Deuterian engine which utilizes the Deuterian Beam Energy Transfer System. Minerva and Zaft are gathering at Gibraltar and planning an attack on Heaven's Base, the Alliance's closest base from Gibraltar. Durandal meets with Ray. Mir Campbell is there as well. She overhears them talking about framing Atherin with a crime, since his ties with the Archangel seems to be too strong. Mir goes to warn Atherin but it is too late. Security comes to his door. He takes them down and he tries to escape with Mir, but she is crazy and thinks she is the actual Laxus. He stumbles into Mirin's room. Mirin is the communication specialist on board and is also Luna Maria's sister. Maiden helps Athen escape. She hacks into the base and sets off the alarm as a decoy. They head towards the hangar and try to steal the goof Igniden. Ray tries to stop them before they make their escape. Shin and Ray get into the legend and destiny. Ray tells Shin the enemy is Ather. Zaf finds out that the hack came from Marin's room. Durandal calls Ray and asks if Marin was with Atherin. He tells him yes and that he thinks that she is helping Atherin. Durandal orders the two to shoot down the goof even with Marin on board. They begin to fight. Atherin tries to convince Shin not to fight but he does so and takes out the goof. Luna Maria is informed that her sister was killed in action. Zaf began Operation Ragnarok. Their attack on Heaven's base. Ah, I see what they did there. The Archangel picks up a message from Gibraltar. They are demanding that Heaven's base relinquishes all members of the Logos and all forces are to immediately disarm and abandon the base. If Heaven's base falls, then Orb Union will most likely be the next target. Everyone preps for the battle. Lord Gibral gives a generic speech about controlling the masses. On board Minerva, Luna Maria and Shin have a cry and hug, and then they kiss over the loss of Marin. Ew. 
the Alliance sends out everything they have. One unit that we see here is Forbidden Vortex. The GAT 7070E Forbidden Vortex is similar to the Forbidden Gundam Blue. Its key players are the Phonon Mazer Cannon and the Geshmitic Panzer. Another is the Euclid. The TS MB1B Euclid took their data from both the Gelski and the Zamzaza and made a new mass produced mobile armor. It has two seven barrel Gatlin machine guns and two high energy beam cannons. But the biggest thing that they have are the five destroy Gundams. Sting Oakley is piloting one of them. And I gotta tell you, Vadi died during the Battle of Berlin. Not gonna lie. The battle begins. The destroy Gundams do a lot of damage and fast. Zaf starts deploying units from space. They descend onto the battlefield. Meanwhile, the Alliance whips out their secret weapon, the Nibelung Anti-Air Cannon. The Alliance was able to take out any attack from above quite swiftly. The Minerva finally launches their mobile suits. Luna Maria is now the pilot of the Impulse Gundam. Atherin is of course alive and on board the Archangel. Maiden survived as well. He is too weak to move. Shin, in Destiny, activates his seed factor and does damage to the destroys and the Windoms that are currently attacking. Destiny destroys one of the destroys. This time, I think that Sting is dead. You never know though. One by one, the destroys go down. Zaft has the upper hand and gains control of the base. Lord Jibral decides to bail deserting all of the other Logos members. Da Costa is exploring the abandoned Mendel colony. They think that they finally understand Durandal's true intentions. While the Archangel is getting fixed, Kida feels powerless currently. And this brings up a good point. Who is Kida without the mobile suit? He never really did have a Spider-Man moment, did he? Kigali makes sure she hits her one note in the series while comforting Atherin. In space, Lacus and the Klein faction run into some notes regarding the Destiny plan, but they are spotted by a recon Jin. They decide to take off since they have been spotted. They will try to send the data that they got on the Destiny plan to Kira on Earth. The Eternal is equipped with the Dom Trooper. The ZGMF XX09T Dom Trooper is piloted by the Klein faction and created by them along with Terminal. If you were wondering, how does Lacus create all these mobile suits? It's all thanks to the terminal. The Dom Trooper also can use the wizard system just like the Zaku. It mainly uses the easy wizard which we will see used here where they are equipped with an additional thruster and an enhanced beam saber. Atherin spaces out and yells at Kita that Lacus is the key like he is Lois Lane in the Zack Snyder film. Kita borrows the Strike Rouge with the attached strike booster to get it up into space. Watfield launches in the Gaia Gundam. This is the same Gaia Gundam that we seen Stella pilot originally. Kira in the strike makes his appearance. He ejects from the booster and relies on the Atori, but he launches the Atori pack right towards some Zakus. Watfield tells Kira to go to the Eternal and get his new suit. He docks and meets with Lacus. She takes him to the hangar and gives him the Strike Freedom. The ZGMF X-20A Strike Freedom Gundam is of course more ridiculous than the original Freedom, but it is also equipped with the Dragoon System. The Dragoon System integrates with the Multi Lock-On System. Remember, the Dragoon System is the Cosmic Era equivalent of Funnels. Like Destiny, it also has the Vulture and Lumiere propulsion system and an in-jammer canceller. The Hyper Deuterian engine is a hybrid between the Deuterian engine and nuclear power. It also has variable phase shift armor and can use the Meteor units. Kira launches in the Strike Freedom and handles business. He's able to disable three Nazca class ships and a series of Zakus and Goofs. Durandal promotes Shin and Rey to faith members. Talia is mad at Durandal for the way that he handled the situation with Atherin and Marin. Zaft finds out that Jibril is actually hiding out in Orb. Specifically, the Saren family is harboring him. Meanwhile, Unisaden sends a message saying that they don't have them. Great move, dude. Great move. Zaft, of course, attacks Orb. They also attack the Saiyan estate. Kagali wants to launch in the Sky Grasper, but Colonel Kisaka and Etika tell her to go with him. 
Uzumi left a message to Kigali that if Orb happens to run into a scorched earth situation, then use this mobile suit to protect the nation. That mobile suit is the Akatsuki Gundam. The Orb 01 Akatsuki Gundam is an Orb prototype Gundam that I guess you could consider Orb's final form for the Strike Gundam and the Striker Pack system. Its gold color is reserved for Orb's ruling class and is known as Yata no Kagami. Yata no Kagami is a Japanese myth that represents a bronze mirror, a part of the Imperial Regalia of Japan. While in Earth atmosphere, the Akatsuki is equipped with the Uwashi Sky Pack, which allows the unit to fly in Earth atmosphere. Later we will see Nia Laflaga use the Shiranui Space Pack in space. The Shiny Paint is able to reflect and deflect beam tech. This unit is also heavily influenced by the Hyakushiki from Universal Century. Of course Kagali has herself a little cry session before heading out. She launches with a team of Murasames. They start defending Orb. She sends a message to Orb Headquarters to tell them to arrest Yuna for his treason. The Minerva makes its way to Orb. Shin decides to go out alone. He launches and is met with Kigali and the Akatsuki Gundam. Ramius gives Neo the Sky Grasper to use as he is free to go and no longer a prisoner. Atherin wants Marion to get off the Archangel once they leave Orb but she doesn't want to be left behind. Shin and Kigali begin their first fight. Shin gets the upper hand, but luckily she has the Murasamis to help her out. Shin takes down the Murasamis with ease and focuses his attention on Kigali again. He takes out one of the Akatsuki's arm. Suddenly Kira in the Strike Freedom comes down and helps out. Also with him is Lacus in the Infinite Justice Gundam. The ZGMF X-19A Infinite Justice Gundam is the successor to the Justice and is created based off of all of Atherin's flight data. This Gundam is specifically designed for him to pilot. Like the Strike Freedom, this mobile suit also has an in-jammer canceller, hyper deuterion engine, and can use the Meteor system. This Justice also has the Phantom Zero One. Like the Double O, this drastically improves mobility and can be detached to ride on. Lacus takes the Justice to the Archangel for Atherin, while Kira continues helping out Orb. Dawn Troopers come down from space as well. These are piloted by Lacus loyalists, Hilda Harkin, Mars Simeon, and Herbert von Reinhardt. They resemble in many ways the Black Tri-Stars from the original Mobile Suit Gundam. Kira and Shin fight, but Rei tells Shin to retreat for now. Kigali runs into the government building and punches Yuna. She asks him where Jibril is, but he doesn't tell her. Meanwhile, Athrun spends the entire episode staring at Infinite Justice. Neo Laflaga in the Sky Grasper also comes in and helps the Archangel. Wait, they gave a former prisoner a loaded Sky Grasper with missiles and everything? What if you just gave him the Sky Grasper and he ends up murdering you? I know it works out in the end, but that was not a good move. Shin refuels, and this time Destiny and Legend both launch. Atherin finally stops staring at the thing and starts piloting Infinite Justice. Kira takes on both Destiny and Legend. The Sky Grasper does an emergency landing on the Archangel. Atherin comes in and helps out Kira. He tells Shin to stop being a bitch, but Rei comes in and attacks Atherin. Back on Orb, Yuna gets crushed by a goof. Womp womp. Atherin is able to get the upper hand on Shin. A shuttle takes off. It is Jibril. Luna Maria launches in the core splendor and tries to intercept the shuttle. However, it makes its escape back into space. The Zaft flagship is destroyed, which means Talia and the Minerva are assuming command of this mission. She recognizes they are at a disadvantage and decide to retreat. Atherin is injured really badly. He gets thrown back into the medbay. Kigali makes an official statement about the actions on Orb, but her broadcast is cut short by the fake Lacus, trying to sway the people. But then, the real Lacus does a reverse Uno on Zaft and interrupts their broadcast. She lets the world know that she is the real Lacus. She tells the world that Durandal has a secret plan that he seems to be hiding from his people. Durandal tells Mir that she should probably keep a low profile. The Minerva is ordered to head towards the moon. Jibril plans on using the Requiem, a giant space laser on the moon. He plans on taking out Aprilius I, Zaf's capital. Ray doesn't believe anything that Orb has to say and brushes it off as propaganda. Ray then tells Luna Maria that Atherin was piloting the red mobile suit and that he is alive. She wonders if Marin is also alive. Durandal heads towards Messiah, a Zaft mobile 
Temple Fortress. Izak and Diarka go out to investigate. They run into some windows near some colony bits. The Requiem fires. It uses the colony bits which curve the beam and aim it towards the plants. It takes out plants such as Januarius but misses the capital. Gibral plans on a second attack on the plants. The Minerva makes their way towards the Alliance moon base. The Minerva team launches along with Izak and Diarka. The Alliance launches destroy Gundams, but Shin is able to take them out relatively easy now. Gibral plans to make his retreat while the second shot of the Requiem goes off. He and some Alliance members attempt to escape on the Gertie Lu class ship, but Ray notices and destroys it, killing Gibral. Luna Maria is able to take down the lunar base. The Archangel plans on making its way out to the lunar city, Copernicus, but Kigali will not be joining them. She salutes them as they make their way towards space. The Archangel makes its way to the lunar city. Back at Aprilius 1, Mir is lying low and doing a little sad girl singing. Meanwhile, it's time for a little shopping montage. Mir's Haro gives them a note saying that Mir needs help. It is an obvious trap, but they still need to go help her. They go to meet with her at her compound. She claims to be the real Lacus and pulls a gun on them, but Atherin shoots the gun out of her hand. That happens a lot in this show. There should be people missing more fingers. Lacus gives a speech to Mir, but snipers try to shoot her. They get to cover and begin a shootout. They are able to take out most of the mercs. Boo comes in to help them out. They make their escape, but Mir sees that one of the mercs is still alive and about to shoot Lacus. She saves Lacus, but is shot in the process. They take out the remaining merc. Mir shows Lacus a picture of what she looked like before her glow up and dies in her arms. The Destiny plan is revealed to the world in a propaganda video. Essentially, it is a program where every single human's genetic information is used to provide the perfect job for said human based off of their genes. Hell yeah, f*** <laughs> your free will, bitches. Ray is really into Durandal's plan. He cockblocks Shin so he could tell him how strong he is. Okay. Orb officially rejects this plan, of course. Durandal recognizes that the Alliance no longer has any leadership now and that Logos is taken care of. It is now a matter of attrition, so Durandal is ready to make a big move. Now that Zaft is in control of Requiem, he decides to fire it on the Alliance's lunar base on the other side of the moon. It takes out the base, killing the president in the process. The Archangel makes its way towards the battlefield to destroy the Requiem. They are with the three ships faction, like the previous war. However, this time, they have the power of the Orb Union to help them. Justice and Freedom launch. They are equipped with the Meteor Units. Lacus sends a message to the world telling them that they are going to destroy the Requiem, for it is a weapon of mass destruction. Lacus intends on doing this by using weapons of mass destruction. Hmm. Meanwhile, pew pew. <laughs> Shin and Rei meet Durandal. Shin is finally having a little bit of self-doubt. He reflects on when Rei told him that he was a clone. Unlike Rala Crusette, who wanted to destroy the world for being a clone, Rei seems to be content with what he is. Neo Laflaga launches in the Akatsuki. The Dom Troopers launch as well. Luna Maria launches from Minerva. Isaac and Diarka heads towards the battlefield. The Minerva fires its Tenhauser at the Archangel, but Mu is able to deflect it, similar to how he saved the ship from the Dominion two years ago. Station 1, one of the colony bits that curves the Requiem, is destroyed. The asteroid base Messiah makes its way towards the moon and fires Neogenesis. It takes out big chunks of the fleet. Legend and Destiny launch from the Messiah. Atherin fights Shin. Isaac decides to help out, but only helps out the Eternal because it is a Zaft ship. While fighting, Ray realizes that his purpose as a clone of Aldeflaga is to become the new Raoul Le Crusade. Atherin calls him a bitch and to stop using the past to justify his fighting. Atherin takes out Impulse Gundam, incapacitating Shin. Freedom is able to incapacitate Ray in the legend as well. Messiah loses contact with both mobile suits and preps Neogenesis to attack Orb. Both Akatsuki and Justice are able to destroy Neogenesis from going off. Meanwhile, the Minerva is about to go down. Talia tells everyone to abandon ship while she goes to talk to Durandal. Kira breaks into the Messiah and finds Durandal. They point guns at each other while monologuing. Ray sneaks onto Messiah and ends up shooting Durandal. Why? Because he said that he is Rao now, so he has to do everything that Rao did? I don't know. This is really, let's say, an interesting writing choice. 
So first, Kira said two sentences in front of Ray, and apparently that was enough to move Ray into shooting Durandal. Okay? In this moment, Ray and Talia decide to stay with Durandal as he dies and the Messiah goes down. Now it is insinuated that throughout the whole series that Talia and Durandal have had a relationship on and off in the past. Talia also mentions that she has a son as well, but she chooses to stay with Durandal instead of, you know, try to get back to her son. Doesn't seem very motherly. And I'm not going to touch the weird mother role she is taking with Ray in these final moments as well. But if I had to guess, Talia referred to Durandal and herself as Ray's parents because she knew he was a clone, and that would probably be something that he would want to hear before he dies. If that is true, that is a very nice sentiment that she should probably be using on her actual child. This is some pretty bad writing. Kira and Atherin make their escape from the Messiah. Lacus sends a message to all remaining Zap forces, recommending that they all cease fire. Meanwhile, on the moon. Look at this loser. Going to cry because you lost, loser? Yeah, cry it out, loser. Everyone stops fighting. Over the next few months, Orb and Zaft came to a peace agreement. During these negotiations, Lacus acted as a mediator between the two nations. After the peace negotiations, Lacus Klein finally returned to the plants after years of being an enemy of the state. Later on Orb, Kira and Shin finally meet each other for the first time. Kira invites Shin to come and fight with them. We end the series with Kira wearing a Zaft Commander uniform, going up to the plants to meet with Lacus, who seems to be the new Zaft Supreme Chairman. And that will do it for the Cosmic Era 73 and Mobile Suit Gundam Seed Destiny. Wow, this, this was a bad one. Kigali literally has nothing to do in the last half of the series and barely spoke. So much so that rumors about the director Fukada having an affair with a voice actress started arising. Also, as much as I do not like Shin, he should have been the focus of the show and bringing in Lacus and Kira as the focus of the story was a bad decision. I see the term authoritarian pacifist thrown around in regards to Kira and the way they wrote Kira and the Archangel crew. That term makes a lot of sense. They just come off as terrorists, but we are supposed to root for them? I don't know if I want to. Also a personal gripe, I don't know why, but the gold accents on the Strike Freedom really bugged me. So when I saw the Rising Freedom in Gundam Seed Freedom trailer, I was relieved by the color palette. I dig the white accents so much more than the gold. The next week leading up to the release of Gundam Seed Freedom will be all things Cosmic Era. We still have the Astray OVA as well as CE73 Stargazer. I will also be doing a breakdown of the Gundam Seed Freedom trailer and what we should be expecting going into the movie. But that will do it for now. Remember new types, you too can also be a commander in two armies if you practice authoritarian pacifism. Peace.